So let's briefly recap what we learned about double selection procedure for inference. I would like to start with a motivating example. There is a study by Chen, Ebenstein, Greenstone and Lee published in 2013 on how air pollution affects life expectancy. They use a natural experiment in China where, according to a policy, those living to the north of the Huai River which traverses through the center of China, were given free coal for heating, while those to the south were not. So they looked at the life expectancy of those living to the north of the Huai River versus those who were living to the south of Huai River. And then they estimate the difference at the discontinuity threshold. So they find that the estimated change in life expectancy was five years and this difference was statistically significant. Now, if you look at the robustness checks, you would see that the results actually differ whether they use linear or quadratic smoothing functions for the degrees to a Huai River, as opposed to cubic, quartic or quintic. So when they use more flexible polynomials here, they find significant effect. And if they, they don't use, they don't find any significant difference. And because of this, this paper was heavily criticized for the choice of cubic polynomial. There were also other suspicions that some important variables have been omitted by authors. So, is the study somewhat different from any other studies? No, such criticism is endemic for empirical papers, precisely because authors often choose the functional forms somewhat arbitrarily. Authors select usually variables based on theory, intuition, but quite often when we are asked should we include the polynomial of the third degree or the fourth degree or why not the fifth degree and uh, why not we create more interaction terms between our variables? Why are we running this OLS rather than another OLS? So in principle how it is done in practice, you run many different regressions with many different functional forms and then you pick the one that you feel most comfortable with. But this unfortunately leads to p-hacking because you also tend to choose the one that has significant results. Choosing good functional forms and important variables is a challenging problem not only in academia, but also in policy evaluation or business research. In this course, you are learning to search for good functional forms in a data-driven manner. You looked at how double selection procedure can help us in searching for functional forms. Double selection can be especially useful when you have cases with too many variables, but no too little theory. Cases where theory suggests some variables, but you don't know whether to include interaction terms or not, or some higher order polynomials of those terms. And in general, we cannot run regression with the number of parameters exceeding the number of observations. So if we had to include all the interaction terms between all the variables, we will easily get our number of covariates higher than the number of observations. So this is a problem. There is still one important assumption that allows you to interpret the coefficients that you find using double selection procedure. And this is an important assumption. You rely on conditional independence assumption, meaning that the dependence between treatment assignment and treatment specific outcomes can be removed by conditioning on the observable variables. So if you do not have an important confounder in your data set in the first place, no amount of machine learning will fix it. So this is something important you have to keep in mind. So we started by revisiting OLS. We said that any OLS can be also represented as a three-step process, where we first regress our outcome variable on all the potential confounders. We get our residuals. Then we regress our treatment variable on other controls. So we partial out the control variables from our outcome variable and from our treatment variable into separate regressions. And then if we regress these residuals on these residuals, our beta coefficient here would be exactly the same as beta coefficient in our initial OLS regression here. We have two assumptions that we still need in order to uh, use lasso to select variables in this setting. We still rely on conditional independence assumption, meaning that this treatment variable is exogenous after we condition on controls Z. And there is another assumption that comes from lasso to work well. Lasso works well only if there is approximate sparsity condition, meaning that only some of these variables are actually important confounders and the rest 
have very little importance for Y or D. So approximate sparsity condition means that the number of important variables should be much lower than the square root of number of predictors. But we do not know which exactly, and LASSO is doing especially well when these conditions are met. So we want to use model selection, but doing it naively can introduce substantial biases, as we saw in the tutorial. That's why we turned to partial naught estimation, basically showing that this task is a prediction task, this task is a prediction task, and only the final step is a very simple inference task, where we just regress one variable on another variable. I sort of called partially out via post last, so that's what we did in the tutorial, as double selection procedure, whereas in fact they are sort of the same in spirit but different in actual implementation. So partially out via post last procedure has three steps. Step one, we run lasso for Y on our potential confounders to select a subset of confounders that best predicts Y. And then we run OLS for Y on the selected confounders and we get residuals. So we get residuals using post lasso of Y on Z. Step two, the same, but for the treatment variable. And step three, we run an OLS for the residuals of Y on residuals of D. The double selection procedure also has these three steps, but they are somewhat different. In step one, you run lasso for Y on Z and you find the subset. So it's exactly the same as 1.1 here, but you don't do 1.2. Step two, you, you do the same for the treatment variable, the same as in step 2.1, but you don't do step 2.2. And in the end, you just regress Y on Z and the union of the important variables that were selected for Y and important variables that were predicting D. And the final ingredient, which was very much important for the double selection procedure, was the choice of lambda when the final goal is inference. So we showed that cross-validation didn't do very well, but if we chose lambda using rigorous last lasso, it worked quite well. Rigorous lasso uses feasible estimation of theoretically founded optimal lambda. Remember, you can do cross-validation to use data-driven approach to finding what lambda gives you the best uh, prediction. But sometimes there is a wide set of lambdas that give sort of the same kind of predictions. And with cross-validation, we still tend to overfit. The optimal lambda using theoretical solution would look like this. It's a formula which has several ingredients in it. C is uh, a coefficient which you need to set up depending on whether you're using post lasso or just lasso. If it's a post lasso, you use 1.1. So these are the default things. Sigma here is true standard deviation of the residuals. We do not observe this, but we, what we plug into here is an estimate of standard deviation of the residuals. This is the inverse of the cumulative standard normal distribution. And gamma here, uh, usually set at 10%, is the probability level of mistakenly not removing the, all of the predictors when all of them actually are zero. And finally, n is the number of observations and p is the number of predictors. Everything here is sort of known except sigma. We do not know sigma, we have to approximate it with our estimate of sigma hat. But how do you plug in sigma hat if you don't know yet what the optimal lambda is? You see, it's a chicken and egg problem. If you know the optimal uh, level of lambda, you know what would be the residuals in this case. But since you do not know the residuals, you don't know yet what kind of lambda it will be. So what do you do? You do an iterative approach for searching optimal level of lambda. So you first get a first initial guess of sigma. You plug it in in this formula, find lambda. It gives you new last estimates, you get new residuals, you estimate the standard deviation of those residuals, you update your guess for sigma, and continue iterating until the new guess converges with an old guess. So basically, if there is no difference between the new guess and the old guess, it means that your code has converged. All of this is done under the hood automatically with our lasso function from the HDM package which you worked with already. There are other theory-based formulas for cases with heteroscedastic errors or clustered errors. So 
this one is for homoscedasticity, and but if you have heteroscedasticity or you have clustered errors, this formula slightly changes. If you're interested, you can always read more from the theoretical papers. Finally, they show in the paper something that resembles what, what we did in the tutorial. They show us and try to convince us using simulations that a naive post-model selection estimator looks incorrect with respect to what it should look like, while the post-double selection estimator has the correct distribution of estimates.